Okay, can everybody see the diapositivo? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, I think this was the slide uh, last time where we stopped seeing them. So I'm going to repeat last class, okay? So the question is, what is life? And does life have a meaning? For biologists, life doesn't really have a meaning. It just occurred or originated. And then those animals or those organisms, which were better adapted, were able to evolve and survive. And so the thing just kept going. The evolution started and uh, life became more complex. But from the thermodynamic perspective, life does indeed have a meaning or a reason, a purpose, a reason for being, and that is to dissipate. And all physicists know that whatever irreversible process which occurs, occurs because of dissipation. So for example, a wind occurs to dissipate a temperature gradient and a current, an ocean current occurs to dissipate also a temperature gradient or can also be a salt gradient in the ocean. So every irreversible process has a meaning or a purpose, which in physical terms is dissipation. And we'll describe a little bit more what dissipation means in the following. So these were the examples I gave yesterday. And these are known as dissipative structures. And this is what Prigozhin won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for in 1977. So on the left-hand side, we have hurricane, which is created by the temperature gradient between the hot ocean surface, the surface of the ocean has to be above about 26 degrees centigrade and the cold upper atmosphere, which at the top of the clouds is about minus 15 degrees Celsius. So this temperature gradient is the external force over the system, which gives rise to a flow and in this case, for the case of the hurricane, it's the flow of heat. The heat from the hot ocean surface to the cold upper atmosphere. Heat can also rise in the atmosphere through conduction. And it will do that if, for example, the temperature gradient is not sufficient, a hurricane will not occur. And we will have only conduction or latent heat, for example, when water absorbs heat and then evaporates that's called latent heat. So we'll have conduction and latent heat unless the, uh, before the temperature gradient becomes a certain value, delta T. And in which case, all of a sudden you get this spontaneous creation of order, which is the hurricane. And this hurricane is arising, like coming out of nothing, arising at uh, self auto catalytic arises and it arises to dissipate this heat gradient. The same is the case uh, for the Barnard cells, which are given in the center diagram, which is a view from above. And this is where we see these convection cells occurring also because of a heat gradient. So we have a liquid layer, which is heated from below and cooled from above. And beyond a certain gradient of temperature, Again, we get this uh, automatic production of structure, which in this case are the Barnard cells or the convection cells. In the other case to the right of that is the belousov zabotinsky reactor system. And this is a system in which we have a chemical potential over the system. So that means we have chemicals coming into the system and being transformed through chemical reactions and then leaving the system as products. So if we assume that the flow 
of the input chemicals and the flow of the output chemicals are constant in time, then we have a constant chemical potential over the system and that gives rise to these structures, these dissipative structures, which are known as the belousov savotinsky structures. And these arise to increase the rate of the dissipation of the chemical potential in this case. In this case, it's not a heat gradient or a temperature gradient. It is really a chemical potential over the system. Okay, and this is this case of belousov savotinsky is in fact breaking of symmetry in both space and time because these figures here are changing in time also. And you can see that if you go to YouTube. Has anybody checked that out on YouTube, the belousov savotinsky reaction? Can everybody hear me? You have to put on your microphones if you want to speak. Can anybody hear or don't understand? Yeah. Déjame intentar a repetirlo en español. Si han logrado a ver en YouTube los reacciones belousov zabutinsky ¿Hay alguien si ha logrado entrar y encontrar estos Sistemas uh, de belousov sapotinsky No. No? Todavía no. Sí, sí escucho, pero todavía... Ok. Es que está algo... It's kind of weak, the Wi-Fi. Ah, uh -huh, ok. It's giving problems? Yes. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have only this uh, standard Wi-Fi from Telmex. Here in the house, it's the only Wi-Fi I have. So maybe then, um, it may be if somebody else has the video on, it might be saturating the bandwidth. Does everybody have a problem with the Wi-Fi? Is it okay for others? Sí. Sí, el mío está bien. Okay. Okay, let's go on and let's, because there's no other option right now. Um, let's go. So, yes? No, it's okay, thanks. Okay, let me know if you still have problems. Write me an email. Let me, if you have any ideas how to improve the bandwidth so we have less problems with the Wi-Fi, let me know. Okay, Santos, right? Okay. It comes and goes, but oh, no. uh, currently it's okay. What about the video? Did you look at the video after I recorded it from last class? Uh, it seems to be okay. So if you're having problems now, later after class, check the video because it seems to be uh, better with it when it's uh, Taking. Okay. Okay, so what I want to say also today is that life, like this tree, is another example of a dissipative structure. In particular, the pigments inside the leaves of plant are acting just like little hurricanes or Bernard cells. They are absorbing light coming from the sun and converting this light into infrared light. So they absorb visible and ultraviolet light and they convert it into infrared light, which is heat. So that is a dissipated process just as the hurricane is dissipating the temperature gradient, life is dissipating the photon potential over the system. So all irreversible processes, life included, arise, persist, proliferate, and evolve to dissipate a generalized thermodynamic potential. I just changed the slide, but it seems to be stuck again. <laughs> 
really having problems with the computer. Okay. Okay. So what I want to give you an example of life acting as a dissipative structure are these echospheres. These are spheres of glass which contain within them water, salt water, and some organisms, for example, algae, and these little shrimp that you see in the picture in the middle. And this system is completely contained so in fact, it is called a closed thermodynamic system because energy can enter, for example, light and heat can enter, but there can be no transfer of mass because of the glass surrounding of the sphere. So this is an obvious case in which we see that an ecosystem is dissipating the light the photons which are coming in. And we'll see that today in, in today's class, exactly what that means. Okay, so these echospheres are completely contained, closed thermodynamic systems, which are dissipating the photon potential. And the animals, the organisms, have been known to survive for about 10 or 12 years, these little shrimp, and even multiply within this closed system. Okay, so what is the importance of uh, thermodynamic description? Well, we know that material, even a small piece of material, let's say one gram of material, contains on the order of 10 to the 23 particles. That means there are as many particles within one gram of material as there are all of the stars in our universe. So that is an extremely large number. So to describe such a system, because for example, if it's in a gas or in a liquid, each particle is moving it relatively independently. And so we have a coordinate description, which consists of X, Y, and Z, the position coordinates of each of the particles, and the momenta, Px, Py, and Pz, so that gives us six coordinates for each particle. Here we could also include acceleration in the case that we have potential interaction between the particles. But if we assume that they are ideal particles, these particles only act at an infinitesimal small distance, then we can ignore the accelerations. But even so, with six coordinate description, six times 10 to the 23, coordinates is too much to handle with today's computers and probably the computers for a long, long time in the future. So we need to come to a macroscopic description at a level which we are familiar with in everyday life because we don't have to know what is going on at the microscopic level, especially if we can average over all of the, the particles in the system. If those averages turn out to be more important, then the particular movements of each particle, then we can have this macroscopic description, this thermodynamic description. And in this description on the right here, uh, we have only a few coordinates, the energy, the entropy, pressure, volume, temperature, etc. So maybe 10 or 20 coordinates to describe the system, which implies an enormous reduction in the number of variables compared to the case on the left in the microscopic system. So that is really the advantage of going to thermodynamic description. And practically there's no avoiding such a description because we don't have the tools to do the calculations on 10 to the 23 particles. So thermodynamics is also based on the symmetries of nature. Kellen in his book 
And if anybody is interested in this book, I can send it to you because I have a copy in PDF. Kellen writes, thermodynamics is the study of the restrictions on the possible properties of matter that follow from the symmetry properties of the fundamental laws of physics. So what are the restrictions on the properties of matter? Well, first the properties are, for example, the temperature, pressure, energy, entropy. And uh, the restrictions can be, for example, is it in the form of a solid, a liquid or a gas? And these depend on temperature and pressure. There are also other restrictions, for example, that the heat capacity at constant volume has to be greater than zero. And this, uh, this gives us uh, thermal stability for the system. For example, you cannot have movement of heat from a cold body to a hot body. It's always from a hot body to a colder body. If we could have movement of heat from a colder body to a hotter body, we could have, for example, all the energy contained within a material going into one specific spot on that material and increasing the temperature dramatically. You know, maybe the temperatures of the sun, depending how small that spot is, with respect to the surroundings. So that doesn't happen. That would imply thermal instability. But we know that we have from empirical evidence, we have thermal stability. So we have these restrictions on the properties of matter, for example, that the heat capacity at constant volume has to be greater than zero. So, and what are the symmetry properties of the fundamental laws? Well, the symmetries are the invariances of the laws of physics or chemistry with respect to time, position, and rotation. For example, if we have invariance of the laws of physics with respect to time, we get conservation of energy. And if we have invariance of the laws with respect to position, we get conservation of momentum. And with respect to rotation, we get conservation of angular momentum. So these are uh, these conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum arise from the symmetry properties of nature. Or you can say, in other words, the symmetry properties of the fundamental laws of physics. Now, thermodynamics also establishes relations between macroscopic variables. For example, the equation of state of an ideal gas is PV is equal to nRT. Okay, and finally, as I mentioned previously, thermodynamics also establishes stability properties. Not only that the, the, the specific heat at constant volume is equal to zero, but there are other stability properties which come out from thermodynamic analysis. Okay, I think uh, this is where I'll leave the last class. This is where we arrived, and this is where I started to repeat with the slides last class. So let me, okay, good. Okay, here we go again. So today I wanna to talk about the thermodynamic dissipation theory of the origin and evolution of life. So here, we know that characteristics of RNA and other fundamental molecules of life suggest an origin of life was driven by UVC photon dissipation. So this is the case in which we are talking about life. Not only that life is a dissipated process, which was known by Prigogine and by Boltzmann, even before Prigogine, a hundred years ago, as I mentioned, life is dissipating the photon potential. But so let's take those insights of Prigogine and of Boltzmann and go directly to the origin of life. And imagine that the origin of life was also a dissipated process, that it was dissipating a photon potential. And here, well, I first started to study this in about 2007. And uh, I started looking at the fundamental molecules of life. Now, these fundamental molecules of life, I think all the biologists know, but the physicists don't know, they are the molecules which are in the three domains of life, which are archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. So those molecules which are in those three domains are probably some of the oldest molecules 
that that life produced at its very beginnings. And uh, from the fact that we know that life is an irreversible thermodynamic process and that it must dissipate a generalized chemical potential. And we know that that generalized chemical potential today is the photon potential. So maybe it was always the photon potential. But if we go back to the beginning of life, we have to produce these molecules, these fundamental molecules, from precursor molecules through changing covalent interactions. Today, we have all kinds of enzymes, complicated biological molecules, to allow us to do those chemical reactions, changing covalent bonding. But at the beginning of life, we, don't, we didn't have those uh, enzymes or those complex proteins around to help us. So everything must have been done physically from the environment. So therefore, it seemed obvious to me at about 2007 that it must also have been light, but in the shorter wavelength region, invisible light. Why? Because visible light, light does not have enough energy to make and break carbon covalent bonds. So we need stronger light, which means light at shorter wavelength, light which carries more energy, which is light in the ultraviolet. So I started looking at these fundamental molecules and looking at their absorption spectra. And quite interestingly, most of them were absorbing at about the same region in the spectrum, in the solar spectrum. They were absorbing at about around 260 nanometers, which is in the ultraviolet in C, ultraviolet UVC range. And uh, this range goes all the way from something like 120 nanometers, if I'm not mistaken, to about 280 nanometers. So it seemed that life, these fundamental molecules at least, were absorbing in the long wavelength part of this UVC range region of the solar spectrum. So I made this postulate that life was probably overwhelmingly concerned with photon dissipation and that at the beginning of life, that photon dissipation was in fact in the ultraviolet in the UVC range. So I wrote a paper on this and then about 2009, I published on the archive, the Cornell archives. Now the Cornell archive is uh, a place where you can put your paper up even without peer review and then wait for response, no, because there's your email, people can contact you. So I put this paper up describing how many of the fundamental molecules of life are absorbing around 260 nanometers. And in fact, it was just this region which was arriving at Earth's surface. And this was some of the work which was done by Carl Sagan, who showed in the 1970s that given the most probable constituents of the atmosphere in terms of gases, for example, uh, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, maybe some hydrogen, and probably some aldehydes which are produced from UVC light interacting with uh, carbon dioxide and water, for example, formaldehyde, one can show that the light which would, would have been entering in this UVC range was exactly that where the fundamental molecules were absorbing. So I put this paper up on the archive and um, waited for responses. And uh, I waited a few days and there was no response, a week, still nothing. And then about two weeks, I finally got a response. And this was from somebody who, who wrote, well, uh, I'm going to say it in Spanish so you understand me maybe a little more. He said, este pendejo no sabe que la, la vida es, uh, la luz ultraviolet es muy detrimental para la vida. Entonces, that was the only reaction I got 
to my paper for a long time and it later sat there for about two years without any interest. And then the interest started to pick up slowly when I started to publish other papers also giving more evidence for this. Uh, and now, in fact, there's a lot of people who are copying this idea, even some from MIT, which don't uh, cite us. They don't give us recognition for being the first. But anyway, it's becoming quite popular now that uh, the origin of life started through photon dissipation. Still, a lot of those who are, are uh, liking this idea don't realize that there's a difference between using UVC light to produce the molecules and dissipating UVC light into heat. Because the real thermodynamic function that we are saying of life is to dissipate this light, light into heat. It is not that the light is useful for producing the molecules as many of them who are now taking up this idea are saying, so some of them are still getting it quite wrong. The main point is that dissipation is the most important, is the real physical process, the irreversible process which is occurring. And the production of uh, biological molecules and increases in complexity is all related to the dissipation, to increases in dissipation. So dissipation has to be at the front and center of any theory regarding the, the origin or the, the evolution of life. Okay, so here I have a picture of Lake Louise in Banff. This is in Banff National Park in Canada, in Alberta. It's actually very close to my hometown, Edmonton. Well, about 200 miles, which is maybe 300 kilometers. Uh, and this has a very particular significance, this picture here for me, because this was the first time I gave an international conference. At that time I was in nuclear physics. So I gave this, my first conference as a graduate student, my first talk to about 400 participants from all over the world in this hotel. And you can imagine I was as nervous, very nervous. And for my bad luck, they gave me the very last talk, El Ultimo Practica de Todos. And so I suffered for maybe three or four days, knowing that everybody in the audience was more knowledgeable in nuclear physics than I was. But uh, I was able to get, get going. After get going uh, at the beginning, I was able to, to give a, a, a decent or reasonable talk. So this, this hotel here has a lot of significance for me. And if any of you get a chance to, to visit Canada, you should visit the Rocky Mountains, go to Banff and Jasper National Park, and especially to Lake Louise. This hotel was built by the Canadian Railroad in the 1800s, but it's been taken over now. I think now it's the Fairmount Company, which is taking care of the hotel. But it's a very beautiful place to go. But I wanted to show you this picture, not to remind you of my experience there, but to have, to have you notice that the trees around the lake are completely black or they're very dark. So these trees are absorbing almost all of the sunlight which is impinging on them. So wherever we have pigments in the trees on the leaves, for example, we have water and we have sunlight, then we have dissipation. So what I would like to propose today is that RNA and DNA and other fundamental molecules of life began as microscopic dissipative structures in the UVC. So here in, in the background of this picture, we have a DNA which is absorbing an ultraviolet photon on one of the bases. For example, you know that the bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and dimine. They are absorbing photons and converting these photons into heat. So that is what I am suggesting was the initial purpose of 
life or the origin of life that was its purpose to dissipate photons in the ultraviolet. Now there's a little bit of delay in changing the slide. Just wait for a while, but does anybody have any questions about concerning that? Is that clear? Hay algunas preguntas de algunos respecto a la, la idea principal y la vida es una sistema disipativa y en el origen de la vida uh, había luz ultravioleta que estaba llegando a la superficie de la Tierra y parece que todos los moléculas fundamentales de la vida absorben muy fuertemente esta luz en el UVC y disipan, disipan esta luz en calor. ¿Cómo lo ven el propuesto? Estoy esperando que se cambie. Yo creo que vamos a tener que ir a, a otro sistema porque el Zoom no está funcionando bien, por lo menos con el Internet, el Wi-Fi que tengo yo. A lo mejor por mí. Pero por Google. Por Google Meet. Por Google Meet, sí, en Classroom, ¿no? Quizás haya un. Sí, quizás hay mejor. La próxima, déjame checar, déjame revisar. Y, y vamos por Google Meet en la próxima. Porque ahorita ya no me está dejando cambiar. Déjame ver si. Ok, así ah, con esta sí. Ok. Profesor, pero sí, sí se entiende. Pero. Eh. No. I have a question. Sí, okay. And, and we can perform an experiment where we, uh, where we put uh, like uh, ultraviolet light with with the conditions of life, just like the Uray Miller experiment, but with this hypothesis about solar photo potential. Yes, in fact, uh, we have done some experiments and I won't get to talk to them today, but the next class, I'm going to talk a little bit about the experiments. In fact, Ivan, who is the ayudante, he uh, did some experiments together with me on this. So he can also talk about that. Uh, but yes, we have done experiments and they do seem to suggest that Ultraviolet light played a, played a very important part in the origin of life. So I'll talk a little bit about those experiments in the next class. And throughout the course, we're also going to be looking at other experiments which have been done. And of course, the Stanley Miller experiments were done with, uh, with uh, electrical discharges. But in fact, from electrical discharges, you also produce some ultraviolet light. They also give rise to ultraviolet light. So some of that may have been due to the ultraviolet light from the, the uh, electrical discharges that gave rise to the formation of these amino acids. No, he was able to produce a number of amino acids through um, discharges, spark discharges on a methane and carbon dioxide and water environment, essentially. So it has been known for some time that ultraviolet light is able to produce some of the fundamental molecules. But what, what has been really missing is the idea is that it is not only that you can produce these molecules with this ultraviolet light, it is that these molecules are actually like little hurricanes. They are dissipating this UVC light. And that is their reason for being or their reason for occurring. Just like a hurricane, the reason for the appearance of a hurricane on an ocean surface out of almost nothing is due to this dissipative structuring. So that is the new component that we're putting into this is that these fundamental molecules are dissipative structures, but they are dissipative structures at the level, at the microscopic level, and they are dissipating ultraviolet light. So that is the new component. And once you look at life, 
as being uh, a dissipative structure and dissipating in the whole region of the spectrum now, then you can explain a lot of things. So we hope to get into some of them in today's class. But anyway, getting back to this slide, this is again the slide of the dissipative structure, so I won't repeat it. But the idea is just that the pigments in, for example, this tree on the right are also dissipative structures, just like these other structures, just like the hurricane, just like the Bernard cell, and just like the belousov zabotinsky reactor system. Let me see if I can go in to full mode without losing you. Can you still see the the, yes. the positive? Okay. So um, what is then photon dissipation? Well, Boltzmann actually wrote about this in 1886 when he associated photon dissipation with life. He said that the general struggle for existence is not for raw material, nor for an energy, but for low entropy, which becomes available through the transition of energy from the hot sun to the cold earth. So what exactly does that mean from the hot sun to the cold earth? Well, for example, we know that within the interior of the sun, we have a very high temperature, some maybe 10, 12 million degrees Kelvin. So we get uh, hydrogen fusion going on. And this hydrogen fusion is causing all kinds of other nuclear reactions to occur. And eventually we have a surface of the sun at about 5,600 degrees centigrade or Kelvin, which is producing photons of a spectrum corresponding to that temperature. So you physicists know that whatever uh, object you have at a given temperature, it gives out a black body spectrum. And it's like this, this spectrum in red on the right hand side of this graph. This is the spectrum which is given off by uh, the surface of the sun at a temperature of about 5,600 degrees Kelvin. And we can see that some of this light is in the ultraviolet and a lot in the visible and also quite a bit in the infrared. Now this light, some of the light is arriving at the Earth's surface. A very small portion, which is equal to the solid angles suspended by the Earth from the surface of the sun. And some of this light is being scattered by the atmosphere, about 30%, that is known as the albedo. But the other 70% is being absorbed by the atmosphere and by the surface of Earth, and then being converted into long wave radiation, which is then emitted in a four pi solid angle, that means around the whole Earth, uh, during the day and during the night. So the Earth then is absorbing this light, not only on organic pigments, but on rocks, and on water, it's absorbing this light and converting it into infrared light. <clears throat> and so that is the dissipation. And uh, what is doing it actually is, as I said, absorbing on material and dissipating into heat. But if you compare, for example, the amount of dissipation that Earth is doing and compare it with Venus or Mars, the neighboring planets, you find that on Earth, we are dissipating about twice as much as what our neighboring planets are dissipating, taking into account the different distances of the planets from the sun and taking into account their surface areas. So taking those two factors into account, we are still dissipating about twice as much as the neighboring planets and uh, we believe that this is due to the ecosystem which are occurring. And in fact, the ecosystems, including all the life within the ecosystems, were evolved to increase this dissipation, to provide this dissipation. So on the right-hand side of this figure, we have the graphs of the, the incident sunlight, which is in red. And we also have the output 
of the sunlight, which is in blue. Okay, and that is at a temperature which ranges from about minus 50 degrees centigrade to maybe 40 degrees Celsius, which is what uh, Claudette just told me that they're, they're, they can have in Sonora or even higher, 50 degrees centigrade. No? So for those temperatures, we have a different spectrum, different emission spectrum. And this spectrum is in, in the infrared at about 10 microns. And this is the, the portion that you see in blue. And the different curves, the solid curves, are for different temperatures, but they vary around 10 microns, more or less. And uh, why do we have only light coming out of Earth in this range? It's because Earth has an atmosphere, and this atmosphere is preventing the emission of light in other regions of the spectrum in the longer, for example, longer wavelength regions or the shorter wavelength regions. So for, for example, below we have the different gases in the atmosphere and where, where they are absorbing very strongly. Where they're absorbing very strongly, we find the shaded regions. So we have, for example, water vapor and we have carbon dioxide and we have uh, the other gases, oxygen, ozone, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and we have also scattering, Rayleigh scattering, which is just a dispersion of light from small particles in the atmosphere or, or molecules really in the atmosphere. So we see that we have a shift of the spectrum. Now the energy which is coming in has to be equal to the energy which is leaving. Otherwise we would have an increase in temperature of the earth. We are getting a little bit of global warming, but it's very small. So there is some increase in temperature. So some of the energy is being captured. Not all of the energy that's being received is being emitted, but most of it is being emitted. Let's say 99.99% of the energy which is being received by the sun is being emitted by the earth, but in the infrared. So that change in wavelength from the ultraviolet and visible to the infrared is what is known as dissipation. This is photon dissipation. And that is the idea of life. Life is just a dissipative process, which dissipates this generalized chemical potential, which is the photon potential from the sun. So now to calculate the change in entropy, it's easy to do. We just take the difference between the entropy of the light which is coming in to that of the light which is going out. And that will give us the entropy production for the Earth. And in fact, we have done that for the Earth and Venus. We have an article written about this, if you'd like to, to read a little bit more upon this. We've done it for Mars and Venus and the Earth. And we find that the entropy production of Earth is about twice as much as Venus or Mars, even taking into account the distances of the different planets from the sun and taking into account their surface areas. Okay, so we can look at the biosphere then as a global dissipated process. There are many processes, irreversible processes, which are occurring in this biosphere. For example, we have ocean currents, we have winds, we have the water cycle, and we have life itself. We as humans are also dissipating chemical potential in the petroleum, which is stored underground. But all of these processes, these irreversible processes, the ocean currents, the winds, the water cycle and life are all based on one other process which is occurring the most important process and that is photon dissipation. Because, for example, they are based on differences in temperatures. For example, the ocean currents are based on differences in temperatures. And how do we change the temperature of the water? Well, for example, cyanobacteria, which are absorbing photons in the visible and ultraviolet, convert this into heat. So we heat the ocean surface, and that creates, for example, hurricanes 
And also, for example, uh, through photon dissipation, we get the growth of trees. And these trees, once they are buried on the ground, they produce petroleum. And this petroleum we are dissipating. So we are really like dissipating the whole, the biosphere is a dissipated process, which is based on the photon dissipation of sunlight coming from uh, cyanobacteria and plants on Earth. So that is the basis of the whole process. One can look at it also as just being the production of bioproduction. But the, if you do that and you consider the traditional Darwinian perspective, then you run into all kinds of problems and paradoxes. But if you stick with dissipation, so for example, we know that uh, only a very small percentage of the light coming from the sun is used in photosynthesis. Most of it is being dumped into heat and that is dissipation. So taking dissipation into account removes a lot of these problems and paradoxes with the Darwinian perspective, which I hope we will have time to see later when we talk about evolution. Okay, so as I mentioned, the pigments are the fundamental molecules of life and I will interchange those two phrases, pigments and fundamental molecules of life, because the fundamental molecules of life, according to us, were pigments, were initially pigments in the ultraviolet. And if you look at a typical leaf, which exists on trees today, and you look at its absorption spectrum, you find that the leaf is absorbing over a way, very wide range of wavelengths from below 300 nanometers to 700 nanometers, which is the red edge. Now, probably all of you biologists know what the red edge is. That's where the pigments all of a sudden stop absorbing light and instead reflect the light. So it occurs at a very particular point at 700 nanometers, which is in the red. And those of you who are photography fans have probably in infrared uh, filters on your cameras. And if you go out at night even, you will find that the trees are very bright in the infrared. So they are emitting and reflecting light in the infrared, starting at about 700 nanometers and going up in wavelength. But the pigments absorb all the way down to even below 200 nanometers. On this graph, we, we stop at 300 nanometers, but down to 200 nanometers, it's absorbing very strongly, all about uh, 95%. So about 95% of the light, light on the leaf is being absorbed and being converted into heat. And only 0.01% of that free energy in that light, the energy which is useful to do work, is being used for the fixation of carbon, which is photosynthesis. So only a very small part of what a plant is doing is photosynthesis. Basically, its whole function is to act as a dissipative system in absorbing light and converting it into heat. Now, you might say that, well, if plants were absorbing so strongly over the whole region of the solar spectrum, why do plants appear to be green? Well, there's two reasons for that. One is that there's a little dip in the absorption spectrum at about 550 nanometers. So about here, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow here, but about here, we're at about 550 nanometers and that is in the green. So for some reason, there's a little dip in the absorption spectrum. And that's why we see the light reflected in the green. And also our eyes, the second reason is that our eyes have been adapted to this region to be maximally uh, sensitive at 550 nanometers. And that's why we see them in the green. But essentially trees are black. All plants are black. They are absorbing very, very strongly all light, almost all wavelengths up to about 700 nanometers. So therefore the real thermodynamic work of plants is not 
photosynthesis. It's not the production of biomaterial, but really the dissipation of sunlight into heat. Just like what a hurricane is doing, or just like what a convection cell is doing, or just like what the belousov zavotinsky reactor system is doing. And uh, well, as I said, not all of the sunlight is absorbed on organic material, but there is organic material in almost all of the Earth's surface. But there are also other components like water and like rocks. For example, we know that water absorbs very strongly in the infrared. So it absorbs in the infrared and water also dissipates into heat, into more in the infrared, into light, which is even further in the infrared, the far infrared. But uh, life, pigments account for about 66% of the entropy production, that is the dissipation, which is occurring about 66% is due to pigments or to life on the surface of Earth. So in this diagram, we see that the solar spectrum, the diagram on the left, we see the solar spectrum in black, and we see absorption of different pigments. Now there's a lot of pigments, you know, and if you include also the fundamental molecules as being pigments, which they are in the ultraviolet, then we'll find this spectrum of sunlight at the Earth's surface being completely full with pigments. So there is, there's an inter interesting question, no? If life was only interested in photosynthesis, why does it need so many pigments? Now the biologists have an, uh, an answer, which I don't feel is a very good answer, but their answer is that, well, these other pigments help to dissipate the, the light into heat so that the, the, they, they protect, sorry, what they, say, what they are saying, not what we are saying, what they are saying is that these pigments are protective pigments. That is that they protect the photosynthetic apparatus from damage. And it might sound reasonable at first, but if you actually ask them, so tell me which wavelengths are being, are causing damage to the, the pigments, to, to the photosynthetic system. Well, they will have to answer that only those wavelengths that are being absorbed. But there are a lot of wavelengths which are not absorbed by the photosynthetic apparatus. And for example, on the diagram on the right, we see that we have the actual photochemical efficiency and the absorption spectrum of just three pigments. So from these three pigments, chlorophyll A, beta carotene, and chlorophyll B, we have enough pigments to fit pretty well the actual photochemical efficiency curve, which is the solid line. So we don't need all the other pigments and the photosynthetic apparatus could be transparent or reflective to the other light without causing damage. So it's not necessarily that the other pigments are there as protective pigments. So we believe that they are there because in fact, the real purpose of light is to dissipate as much light as possible. And that includes all the wavelengths, not only in the ultraviolet, so therefore, according to our view, most important thermodynamic function of life is to dissipate photons into heat using organic pigments in water. And so now, if, the, if, that, is, if that is the purpose of life today, then we can ask, what was the purpose of life in the Archean? But to do that, we first have to decide or to determine what the conditions, what physical conditions were like during the Archean. So these are the conditions at Earth's surface at life's origin about 3.85 thousand million years ago. It's being suggested that the Earth was much warmer then than it is now. First, the interior of the Earth was warmer because there was more radioactivity 
at that time, the radioactive elements had not had time to decay sufficiently as they have today. So the interior of the earth was warmer, so there were more volcanoes. And these volcanoes were spewing out gases like hydrogen sulfide, water, and carbon dioxide, just as they are doing today. It is, it is also known that the seas were very hot. The surface of the ocean was about 85 degrees centigrade. And how do they know that? Well, they do that by studying oxygen isotopes because oxygen comes in different isotopes, oxygen DC6, oxygen 16, and oxygen 18. And depending on the relative ratios of these two isotopes, you can determine what the temperature of the Earth was like. Now, for the physicists, it's rather easy to understand why you could use the ratio of isotopes to determine the temperature in the sediments at that time. And that is because well, you know that if you have a given temperature and different isotopes, like oxygen 16 and oxygen 18, then the lighter isotopes at the same temperature will be moving faster than the heavier isotopes. So the lighter isotopes will penetrate deeper into the sample than the lighter isotopes. And so from the ratios of oxygen 16 to oxygen 18, you can actually determine what the temperature of the earth was like at a given time from the sediments which had accumulated, if you can find sediments available from those times. And they do have sediments available from 3.85 thousand million years ago. And doing the analysis, they show that the temperature was probably around 85 degrees centigrade. Of course, it could have been a little colder at the poles and a little warmer at the equator. But from the limited samples of the sediments they have, they determined an average of about 85 degrees centigrade. So there was also a lot of asteroids and comets because uh, these materials were still flying around. They hadn't collided with planetary bodies yet, so they were still uh, colliding with the Earth. And these comets and asteroids, as you know, can carry organic material. But we, in fact, don't need to assume that in our theory. So that is another theory, you know, that the organic molecules came from outer space because they have found them on comets and on asteroids. But uh, we don't have to assume that. And in fact, we have a theory and the, the same theory goes for these organic molecules in comets and asteroids, that they were produced in space as dissipative structures using the same ultraviolet light from the sun as they were produced on Earth's surface. Now, the atmosphere of Earth contained a lot of nitrogen as it does today in the Archean. So this is the beginning of the Archean, 3.85 thousand million years ago when life began. So there was a lot of nitrogen as there is today. And there was this, this, these uh, gases coming from the volcanoes like hydrogen sulfide, water, carbon dioxide, methane, and probably some hydrogen. But there was no oxygen and no ozone because there were no living organisms. And today, all of, or basically all of the oxygen comes from uh, life, from oxygenic photosynthesis. So with no ozone, no oxygen, that means that light in the UV would have been very intense on the surface of the Earth. So what in fact did the solar spectrum look like at the beginning of life on Earth? And so we did the calculation knowing or assuming these gases really is an assumption, but it's a pretty good assumption, which most are agreed on. And uh, taking into account uh, the spectrum of, of uh, sorry, the, the sun through time, because there is a program to determine how the output, the photon output, the, the spectrum output of the sun changes over time. And they do this by looking at other stars, which are the same type as our star, which is a G-type star. And so from the different ages of the different stars, they can determine what our sun would have looked like, what kind of a spectrum it would have been giving out 3.85 thousand million years ago. And so you might say, well, how do they determine the ages of the sun, the stars? Well, they do that uh, from the rotation rates because when stars are first formed, 
their rotation rate is very high. And as they get older, they start losing some of the angular momentum. And that is also dissipation of angular momentum. Up until now, I have only talked about dissipation of energy, but all of the conserved value, uh, variables in nature, for example, energy, momentum, angular momentum, and charge, they can all be dissipated and they can all give rise to dissipative structuring, but that is involving gravity. So I won't get into that today, but just to, to give you an idea that the dissipation is not necessarily only over energy, it can also be over angular momentum. So the sun's angular momentum has been uh, decreasing over time due to the dissipation. And that's because of giving off particles and also the gravitational interaction with the other planets. Just like, for example, our moon. Our moon is interacting with us gravitationally. It's causing tides, which is causing dissipation on Earth, which is reducing the length of the day. So at the beginning of life, 3.85 thousand million years ago, the length of the day was much shorter. It was something, if I'm not mistaken, and it's not really being determined accurately, but the length of the day was probably, instead of uh, being 24 hours, it was more like around half that or a little bit more than half that, maybe 12 to 15 hours at the beginning of life on Earth. So the Earth was spinning a lot faster. So anyway, to get back to, to this story, so you can determine the age of the sun by its rotational rate, or you can determine the age of any star by its rotational rate. And so we can look at different stars, which are G-type stars. That means they have the same kind of composition. They are second or third generation stars, the same mass as our star, and look at their spectrum. So the different stars, which are rotating at different rates, which would mean different ages. And uh, so what they've determined is that the sun at the origin of life was putting out only about 70% of the spectrum that it's putting out today. Its surface temperature has not changed much, but its surface area has changed. So at the beginning of life, the surface area of the sun was about 30% smaller implying that the amount of light output from that surface at the same temperature would be about 30% less. So at 3.85 thousand million years ago, that's the black line here. You can see my pointer here, that's the black line that gives the spectrum of the sun at the origin of life on Earth. And uh, these little spikes here are due to the absorption of water. These are the water absorption bands in, in our atmosphere. So this is, these are the spectra at the surface of Earth. And this is the wavelength in nanometers at the bottom and the intensity, the flux of the light, how many photons, for example, per square centimeter on Earth's surface in this wavelength range. But what I want to bring your attention to is to this little peak at the left, which is the UVC peak. So I have blown that up on the right here, in the upper right, on the inset. And uh, we see why we get this peak is because we have carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide absorbing below about 200 nanometers. And then we have this window in, in the Earth's atmosphere. This is during the Archaean. And then we get absorption by aldehydes. And remember that aldehydes, I said, were created by ultraviolet light on carbon dioxide and water. So we get these gases, these carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and aldehydes, which are absorbing in these ranges and leaving us with this little peak in the UVC range. Okay, and this little peak in the UVC range existed on Earth's surface for about a thousand million years. So this light was coming into the surface of Earth for a thousand million years. So life had two possibilities, no? If you want to look at it like in the Darwinian perspective, life could have tried to avoid this light because as many in biology say that this light would have been very dangerous. It is indeed today. This light would kill any organism within about three seconds if this light was coming in, even though it's only about five watts 
per meter squared. So a very, very, very tiny light bulb, but in the ultraviolet, this light would be sufficient to destroy any organism today on the surface of Earth. But we're going to argue that it was not sufficient to destroy those pigments, which are known as the fundamental molecules of life. In fact, it was absolutely necessary for their existence, for their spontaneous occurrence, their spontaneous production from precursor molecules. And I'll explain what those precursor molecules would have been for, for these fundamental molecules in other classes. So anyway, we can see how this light has changed, that the intensity is, especially in the, in the visible, has been increasing. And the intensity in the ultraviolet has been decreasing. In fact, at about 2.9 uh, thousand million years ago, this is giga annuals, or GA here. At this time, light in this UVC range was extinguished by photosynthetic organisms doing oxygenic photosynthesis. Okay, so the important point on this slide is that we have this little peak in the UVC range, which was there since before the beginning of life and existed for at least a thousand million years after the beginning of life. So on this Professor, graph, yes, please. Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, uh, may I see the, the last? Yes. Uh, I didn't understand why the first region is like uh, about uh, CO2 and, and then the region after the peak of the UVC is all the all the heights. Yes. Okay. It's this is the absorption spectrum. This is where CO two is absorbing. This is where the maximum because these gases absorb over a rather wide wavelength range. But I've just plotted where their maximum absorbs. For example, CO2 absorbs maximally at about 150 or 160 nanometers. And uh, hydrogen cyanide absorbs at about 180. And the aldehydes absorb at about uh, 300 nanometers, more or less. So this is where the maximum absorption of these gases. So these gases are also dissipating because they're absorbing and they dissipate. OK? absorbing in the atmosphere and they're dissipating. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So on this graph then, I have plotted, well, actually this comes from an article by Nossa et al. in Geophysics Research. They have plotted the ratio of the light in the Archean to the present as a function of wavelength, okay? So they did calculation, just as we did the previous calculation for the spectrum of the sun. They did a calculation, but comparing the ratio in the Archean to the present. And those, these are the black curves that you see here. It's the gray and the black. And therefore different amounts of carbon dioxide assumed to be in the atmosphere. So they have a reference case, which is the black line which I'm, I don't remember how many parts per million of carbon dioxide, but I think it was around 4,000 parts per million. You know that today in the atmosphere, we have just gone above about 400 parts per million. So the CO2 in the atmosphere was about 10 times what it was, what it, what it is today at the origin of life, maybe between five and 10 times. So it's not very well established how much CO2 was available in the atmosphere at the origin of life. But we know, for example, that there was liquid water at the origin of life. And how do we know that? Because we do have sediments from 3.85 thousand million years ago. And these sediments appear that they are deposited by water. These are uh, normal like shales from, from, from that time. So there, there must have been water, liquid water on the surface of earth. But if you remember, I said that our sun was only about 30%, it was only, sorry, about 70% as strong 
in intensity in the light as it is today. So therefore, with only 70% of the sunlight, you would have expected if the position of Earth, the distance of the Earth from the sun had stayed the same, you would expect that the whole Earth would be covered in ice. It would be a snowball Earth. But there is this evidence for liquid water on the surface of Earth at the origin of life. So that means there must have been a very strong greenhouse effect occurring. So that was probably due to the great amount of CO2. So that's how they determined that probably the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere at the origin of life was about 4,000 or between 2,000 and 4,000 parts per million. So those are the black lines that we see here, not plotted as a function of wavelength. So for example, at about 260 nanometers or 258 nanometers, the amount of light in the Archaean, which was coming in compared to the amount of light coming in today was about 10 to the 31 times greater. So that's much, much, much greater. And that's not really a surprise. It's a big number, but it's not a surprise because as I said, we have ozone and oxygen now in the atmosphere, which avoids that any of this light, almost zero photons get in because it's such a good shield. Our ozone shield is shielding us from this, which is now dangerous UVC light. Okay. Now, if one plots the absorption spectrum of DNA, and this is the line in blue, we find almost a perfect overlap. So we get great absorption, about 258 nanometers. Probably a lot of you biologists would be familiar with this absorption spectrum of DNA because they use it in the PCR, polymer acid chain reaction experiments. So you know, you have known that uh, DNA absorbs very strongly this light. It absorbs almost as strongly this light in the UVC as chlorophyll absorbs in the visible. So it's a very powerful pigment, very strongly absorbing pigment. And the curious thing is that it overlaps almost completely the spectrum of the UVC light, which was coming into the Earth's surface at the origin of life. So that is one evidence you know, that life, especially DNA anyway, was absorbing in this uh, spectrum range uh, and was probably a pigment. Now, not only <coughs> does, <coughs> excuse me, not only does DNA do the basis of DNA absorb very strongly in that UVC range, but they also dissipate this energy into heat. So what happens when a photon absorbs on a base like guanine or cytosine or uracil or thymine, it excites the molecule into its first electronic excited state. So it's initially in its ground electronic state and then it gets excited into uh, an excited electronic state. So that means that actually that the electrons take on different orbits around the molecule, okay? And so it excites and then it decays. Now there are different ways that a, an excited molecule can decay. It can decay by phosphorescence or it can decay, which is giving out a photon after a rather long time period or fluorescence, which is also giving, giving rise to a photon uh, after a, a little bit shorter time or it can decay through what is called internal conversion in which all of the electronic excitation energy gets converted into heat. And that's in fact what happens in these molecules, you know, in these fundamental molecules. So in these graphs on the left, they are experiments which are called pump probe experiments. So what they do is they take these molecules and they excite them with a laser at 260 nanometers. That's in the ultraviolet in the UVC range. This is just the energy. This is just the wavelength which was coming into Earth. 
at, uh, at the origin of life. And they excite them into the electronic excited state. And then they measure the population of the excited state, also using another laser, which is called a probe laser, at a different wavelength, which can also excite it into a further excited state. And so based on how bright or how strong that absorption is, they can determine how many molecules are in the excited state as a function of time. And that's what is plotted on this graph on the x-axis is the probe delay in picoseconds. So picosecond is 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So very fast. So we see that for all of these cases, the decay of the excited state occurs within picoseconds, within less than one picosecond is the main decay component, less than one picosecond. There is a, a longer component, which is due to charge migration along the DNA or along the basis in, in the case of double strand DNA. But uh, basically the, it's on the order of picoseconds, which is extremely fast. And there's no photon given off. The energy of the absorbed photon at 260 nanometers is converted completely into heat. And this also occurs, as I said, for DNA in, in the molecules, no? But there are two components for DNA. I'm not sure if you can see the whole slide here. The part at the top of my slide is missing because of this. Um, let me see if I can do that, convert. No, it doesn't want to do that. Okay. So the same occurs for DNA, for segments of different bases. We also have a very rapid decay of the excited state into back to the ground state. So that means that if you can go so quickly back to the ground state, that means that your system, your pigment is ready for another photon absorption after 10 to the minus 12 seconds, extremely rapidly. So how does it do that? Well, it does it through what is known as conical intersections. So here on the bottom right, we have a schematic diagram in two coordinates. Now these are the atomic coordinates of the atoms in the molecules. So you know, for example, that guanine has nitrogen, it has carbon, it has oxygen. So it has like maybe 30 atoms. So there's a lot of coordinates, 30 times three, because X, Y, and Z for each atom. So we have like 90 coordinates, but we cannot do a 90 coordinate diagram here. So this is just a schematic diagram in two coordinates, A, you know, and, and X, sorry, and Y and, and, and X. <clears throat> so the blue part here is the ground state. And uh, when a photon comes in, it's absorbed and it gets to this excited state. And, it's, and very quickly, it goes through this funnel, which allows it to connect to the ground state. So the electronic excitation energy goes very quickly into the vibrational energy or the heat of the molecule. So a photon comes in, is absorbed on guanine. The energy gets very quickly converted into heat, so vibrational motion. So the temperature of guanine goes up to about 2000 degrees centigrade. And then it very quickly decays to the ground state through interaction with water molecules in its environment. So it passes the heat on to the water, which is in the environment. And this is all done very rapidly at about, uh, on a scale of 10 to the minus 12 seconds, picoseconds. So the RNA and DNA bases then are extremely rapid dissipators. And uh, this also then makes them resistant to destruction by ultraviolet light. Why does it make them resistant? I think somebody has their microphone on that are making a lot of noise. So if you can turn off your microphone, please, everybody can turn off their microphone so we don't get this extra noise. Thank you. So this rapid decay from the excited state to the ground state uh, means that the bases are very resistant to damage by this light because there's no time even for chemical reactions to occur. It's occurring so rapidly that there's no time for chemical reactions which are going to change, which could change the molecule. 
So that makes them very resistant. Now, another very interesting fact is that the non-natural tautomers of the bases have much longer lifetimes. So the tautomers is, are when I just move a hydrogen from one place to another on the same molecule with the same atoms, just changing the position of a hydrogen atom, then I change the, the position of the double bonds, but I don't change anything else. They're called tautomers. And there exists for all of the bases tautomers. And most of the tautomers, in fact, are more stable than the Watson Crick bases. That means they have a lower Gibbs free energy. And for the biologists, don't worry about what that means. We'll take a little bit more about that in the course, and that's also in Prigogine's book. But essentially, they have a lower energy, which makes them more stable, the tautomers. But the tautomers, the stable ones, are not the ones which are being used in life. It is these ones, the Watson Crick ones. And it's these ones which have the very rapid decay times for the excited state. So that is an interesting, very interesting fact, which points again to our proposal that these bases were in fact pigments in the ultraviolet. So now let me just go on to the next one. It doesn't want to change again, it's stuck. Let me just give it a little bit more time. But if there's any questions, now is the time to turn on your microphone and ask the question. No hay preguntas. Todo es muy bien entendido. I um and why do we made the plot of the conical intersection? What what is the 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 okay? Mm -hmm. What is the idea of the conical intersection? Well, that's actually on the next slide. I want to show you then. Um, but the idea is just to describe it, how these molecules can so quickly go from their electronic excited state back to the ground state. So normally molecules don't do that. If, you, if they absorb a photon, they stay excited for at least nanoseconds. But here we're talking about picoseconds. So there's very little time they stay excited. So they go back to the ground state very quickly. That means they can be used again to absorb another photon. Because once you absorb a photon and you're in the excited state, you cannot absorb another photon, at least at that same wavelength. So by going to the ground state very quickly, they become very good pigments for dissipation of light into heat. In this case, ultraviolet light for the basis. I still can't change the slide. Hmm. And molecules that uh, it have a time of, I don't know, uh, nanoseconds, like more, more slower. Slower. Uh, uh -huh. Have a conical intersections too? No, they don't. Oh, okay, okay. Don't. okay. And we'll see that, in fact, there are some molecules, like maybe you know tryptophan, which is uh, amino acid. It's an aromatic amino acid, which also absorbs very strongly in the same wavelength region, but it doesn't have a conical intersection. So it takes about nanoseconds to decay. So it's not a very good pigment, but what it can do, what tryptophan can do is connect with DNA. In fact, if it connects with its codon, I'm going to show you a slide of that in a little while. But it, it has chemical affinity, tryptophan, to its codon, you know, which is like GGC, or I don't remember exactly what the codon is, which defines tryptophan. But there is a chemical affinity. So tryptophan can stick to DNA. And then it can pass its energy of the excited state of tryptophan to DNA and use the conical intersection of DNA to dissipate. So therefore, the two molecules, 
separate are worse, they're not as good dissipators as when the two molecules come together. And that might be the reason for evolution, for increasing dissipation through this association of different molecules, tryptophan with DNA, with the basis of DNA. And so we'll get into that in a little while. Yeah, I can, I've been able to make the change. And now we see what is the conical intersection. So this is, this is the same diagram that we had before, but now really only plotted in one of the dimensions. And this is the case for the base, which is adenine. So adenine is initially in the ground state. So it's the bottom of this potential well. And then a photon comes in, gets absorbed, and excites the molecule to the excited state. And that is this other curve, the upper curve in black, which is the excited state. And uh, now this molecule uh, loses some energy through vibrational motion with the water in the environment and eventually arrives at what is called this conical intersection. So this is, this is the conical intersection that I explained on the other slide. It's where the, the, the vibrational states of the ground state coincide with the vibrational states of the excited state. So when I say excited state, this is the excited uh, electronic state, okay? So at this point, when the molecule is here, when it's just absorbed the photon, it still has the same configuration. It still looks like adenine. It's still planar. But as it goes down and loses a bit of energy through vibrational interaction with the surroundings, it goes into this new form here where we see where the, the carbon atom and the hydrogen have come out of the plane. So this pyramidalization is called when it comes out of the plane and that allows it to go down in energy and connect, in fact, with the vibrational states of the ground state. So here we have this connection, the conical intersection, and the system goes very quickly to the ground state, produces heat. That means all of the electronic excitation goes into vibrational excitation, and which eventually gets lost with the water, but very rapidly on the order of picoseconds, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Okay, so this is an example of a conical intersection, how a conical intersection is formed for the case of adenine, which is one of the bases of DNA and RNA. Um, okay. The change in the form uh, of adenine, is, is it still adenine or is now another molecule? No, it's still adenine, but it's just come out of the planar formation. It's no longer planar. You see these carbon and these hydrogen atoms have come out of the plane. So they're sticking up instead of being plane horizontally, they're sticking up vertically. So it's the okay. same molecule, but it's, it's still in an excited state. It still has some energy. This is the potential energy has increased because of the absorption of a photon, but it's gonna lose this energy gradually through vibration. And this is gonna go back to its original configuration which is planar, all, of, all the atoms in a plane at the bottom here in the ground state. So it's the same molecule, the molecule hasn't changed, it's just been deformed a little as it goes through this process. But it's when it comes out of the plane here that the vibrational states of this electronic excited state, and this you have to imagine that the electrons, it's an electron cloud around the molecule which is in like in an excited state. So this electron cloud has been deformed. And then when it, when it goes to this conical intersection, this electron cloud goes quickly back to the ground state. So it's ground, ground state configuration and giving off all of the energy to the vibrational molecule. This is when the molecule arrives at about 2000 degrees centigrade. But that heat is very rapidly dissipated to the, to the water, to its environment, okay? So RNA and DNA then are excellent dissipative structures. So they take one photon in the ultraviolet, absorb it on the basis, and then dissipate this into about 30 photons in the infrared. 
And we do this all within a very short time period of 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So that is exactly what a hurricane is doing. A hurricane is absorbing heat from the ocean surface, which is at a given temperature, like 26 degrees centigrade. And it's absorbing this heat and using it to drive the system, which is providing for a heat flow to the upper atmosphere. So it's changing the heat from 27 degrees, 26 degrees to minus 15 or minus 20 degrees centigrade at the tops of the clouds. And then the heat is given off to the uh, environment, to, this, to space. But it's converting a number of infrared photons into many more infrared photons. So these, these infrared photons at the top of the hurricane are much longer wavelength than those at the bottom. Just the same as in the case of uh, DNA, the ultraviolet light is short wavelength. One photon produces 30 photons of one of much longer wavelength. But the energy is conserved. So the energy in this photon, which came in still, if you sum up all the energies in these photons, they will give you the same energy. We don't lose energy. Energy is conserved. And the same in the case for the hurricane. So the hurricane is a macroscopic dissipative structure. And DNA, we are claiming, is a microscopic dissipative structure. They're both doing exactly the same thing. One working with ultraviolet photons and the other working with infrared photons. And one working with covalent bonding between the atoms and the other one working with hydrogen bonding between the atoms. Because in the case of the formation of a hurricane, the interaction between the water molecules is through hydrogen bonding, which is a very weak interaction. And that's why with infrared photons, we can produce structures. But in the case of DNA with the covalent bonding, the bonding is very strong. So we need ultraviolet light to be able to change the covalent bonding to construct these molecules. So here I'm going to give you the little bit of a description between the differences between microscopic dissipative structuring and microscopic dissipative structuring. So for the case of macroscopic, we have seen the Bernard cells, these convection cells, and we know the belousov zavotinsky reaction system, these structures. Now these structures are based on conduction and convection or the fusion reaction in the case of the Belousov. So these are different irreversible processes. And uh, these structures can be produced at the scale of about 10 microns. You cannot produce structures below about 10 microns with conduction, convection, or diffusion reaction processes occurring. They have to be greater than about 10 microns. But in fact, we know that in life, there does exist structures which are smaller much smaller than 10 microns. For example, the ribosome, which is like a little factory in every cell has this ribosome, which is taking the information from DNA through messenger uh, RNA and converting it into proteins. So it's producing these uh, enzymes or these proteins from the information which is stored in RNA and DNA. And it's doing that on a size of about 10 nanometers. So it's a like little factory, which is working at a size of 10 nanometers. So this is in fact a microscopic dissipative structure. And this is structured not with light, well, not directly with light. Eventually see it, it's being directed by light, but it's really dissipating the chemical potential which exists in, for example, uh, ATP, adenine triphosphate. So we know that microscopic dissipative structure can occur and occurs, of course, in cells. And to get this, we need uh, chemical photochemical reactions or diffusion, plus also structural phase transitions. So here I'm talking about things like these forming new isomers. If you remember in the case of um, the tautomers, the tautomers are just when you move a hydrogen 
proton around the outside of a molecule that forms a new molecule without changing the type or the number of atoms of each type. They are called isomers. So when, when we get uh, these photochemical reactions which are producing isomers, then we can get these microscopic dissipative structuring. Or we can also have ground and excited states, as I explained in the conical intersections. Or we can have molecular complexes or excimer states, which are just complexes of different molecules or the same molecule. So it's like a coupling of two molecules. Or also when there exist phase transitions, when we go from a liquid to a gas, for example. So if we have these structural phase transitions coupled with photochemical reactions or diffusion, then we can get microscopic dissipative structuring, that means structuring on a nanoscale due to dissipation, comes through dissipation. In fact, these structures arise to increase the dissipation. And in fact, this uh, nanos nanoscale microscopic dissipative structuring is a new field in science. And they're using it now for controlled nanoscale structuring. So for example, in this picture at the bottom on the left, this is a picture of nanowires, which have been produced through dissipative structuring, through chemical reactions and phase transitions. And uh, so I'm going to suggest also the DNA at the beginning at the origin of life was also a microscopic dissipative structure, which was constructed through ultraviolet light, UVC light. Okay, so I have been talking about the basis of DNA right now. But in fact, a lot of the fundamental molecules, for example, besides the nucleobases, there are cofactors, amino acids, and there are, uh, what are these? These are proteins, pigments, and lipids. They're all abs uh, absorbing. If you look at the maximum wavelength of absorption, you will find that they all absorb around 260 nanometers. So these are the molecules which are in the three domains of life. So they're some of the original molecules. So they must have been the molecules that have, were around during the Archaean. So for about a thousand million years, since the origin of life at 3.85 thousand million years ago to about 2.8 or 2.9 thousand million years ago, when oxygenic photosynthesis started to occur and this light became blocked because of the ozone and no longer arrived at the surface of Earth. So at the bottom right, we have the graph. Remember, this is the little peak in the ultraviolet in the UVC range of the solar spectrum. This is the light which was arriving at Earth's surface at the origin of life. And now if I plot the maximum absorption wavelength of all these molecules on this graph, then you get something which looks like this. So those molecules are all absorbing around the peak and they're absorbing very strongly at the peak, at that peak intensity. So all of these molecules were probably microscopic dissipative structures which were produced by ultraviolet light on precursor molecules in water. Okay, and so as I mentioned to somebody who asked the question, I didn't uh, get who was who the person was, their name, because their name doesn't appear on the screen anymore. You have to put your names on the screen somehow. I'm not sure how to do that in Zoom, but uh, anyway, somebody asked me a question about tryptophan or other molecules, do they absorb also in this energy range? And as I said, like tryptophan does absorb at about 280 nanometers, but it doesn't have a conical intersection. So it cannot dissipate the light. So if you have a photon which absorbs on tryptophan, it will stay in the excited state and remain that way. So it would not be a very good pigment because it cannot absorb another photon while it is excited. You have to wait until it fluoresces and goes back to the ground state. Then you can absorb another photon. But if tryptophan connects with DNA, particularly with its codon, for which it has a chemical affinity, then you can have what is known as 
energy transfer, resonant energy transfer between the donor and the acceptor. The donor in this case would be tryptophan, which has absorbed the photon, and has the energy absorbed on it, and it gives its energy to the acceptor, which is the DNA, one of the DNA bases like adenine. And then the acceptor uses its conical intersection to go to the ground state. So tryptophan can dissipate quickly, rapidly, as long as it connects, as long as it's close within a certain distance to DNA. And then it can absorb a photon and dissipate it into many other infrared photons. So the two molecules together are acting, they are acting as a better dissipative system than the molecules separated on their own because tryptophan would not be a good pigment on its own. It needs the conical intersection of DNA. And uh, so uh, people, especially Yaris, uh, have done a lot of experiments and they have shown that um, tryptophan and a lot of these aromatic amino acids, uh, tyrosine, phenylalanine, and histidine, along with tryptophan, they all absorb in the UVC range. They don't have conical intersections, but if they connect with their codons and they do have chemical affinity to their DNA codon, then they can dissipate and the system will be a greater dissipative system. And that is essentially what evolution is, it just increases in dissipation, increases in the efficiency of dissipation of the photons which are coming from the sun. And so that might be a way of which information has been encoded in DNA. Because if you think about it a little bit, the association of tryptophan with DNA through its codon, because its codon is where it has chemical affinity. So that allows you to associate these amino acids with their particular codon. And so this information would gradually become stored in the DNA. And why would it gradually become stored? Because as I said, nature is looking to increase dissipation. Dissipation gradually increases over the evolution of the biosphere. So if tryptophan connected with DNA increases the dissipation of the system, then that system is going to be maintained and it will be reproduced when DNA reproduces. And we'll see that in the next class, how DNA can be reproduced and conserve its information regarding its attraction to these particular amino acids, which are strong pigments in the ultraviolet. Okay, so we're almost finished. Sorry for taking so long, but now we're going on to the proliferation of life, which is really the vitality of life. You know that, for example, the pigments can be found, can be found over the whole surface of Earth. <clears throat> and why does that happen? Why does life proliferate so strongly like that? It's increasing its representation on the surface of Earth. And this can also be explained by the thermodynamics of nonlinear irreversible systems. And if you stay with the book of Prigogine, at about chapter six, starts talking about nonlinear interactions. And we'll see that, uh, for example, this particular case of the autocatalytic chemical reaction, which Prigogine presents in the book. So in this autocatalytic chemical reaction, we have a reactant A, which goes to an inter intermediate X and then to a final product B. But X can also produce another product, which we call M. And if we assume that M acts as a catalyst, for the interaction of A going to B. And we assume that A and B are fixed by the environment. So this is the chemical or the concentration of A in the environment and the concentration of B, the product in the environment doesn't change because of the fusion, we have a big supply. And in that case, in the case that M is acting as a, a catalyst for the reaction A going to X or X going to B, then we will find two things. One, that if M is a good catalyst, then the concentration of M will increase much over and above what you would expect if it was a chemical reaction occurring near equilibrium. 
And the second thing we find is also that the global entropy production of the system will increase. And that just makes sense because what if M is a catalyst, that means these reactions are going quicker and reactions, chemical reactions are also an irreversible process. So they're also dissipating and they're, dissipates, they're dissipating the chemical potential and they're producing entropy. This is irreversible processes, remember, produce entropy. So M uh, increases the global entropy production of the system. Okay, so that's in the case of purely chemical reactions in which one of the products acts as a catalyst for the reaction itself. Then we can get a, a large increase in M, much larger than one would expect if it were not a catalyst. And we get an increase in the entropy production of the system. So these reactions go much faster. And we can also uh, make the analogy then with the autocatalytic photochemical reactions, which are dissipating in the solar spectrum. So this is for the pigments, for example, adenine, which acts as pigment in the UVC. So let's just make an analogy. It's not exact, but it's just to, to help you understand what's going on here. It's, it's a simple irreversible process, just like the chemical reactions occurring above. So we imagine that A in this case is the solar photon spectrum at about 5,000, well here 800 degrees. It's some people say 5,500, 5,700, but 5,000, that's the surface temperature of the sun. And X we assume is the molar photon spectrum after absorbing a photon, which is about 2000 degrees Kelvin. And B is the earth photon spectrum, which is about 290. Kelvin. And let's say that M is an organic pigment like adenine, which is being produced from precursor molecules, okay, in this photochemical reaction. And so just as we saw for the purely chemical reaction, the concentration of M, that is the organic pigment, can increase its concentration in the environment much greater than one would expect if it were not a catalyst for this dissipated process. And this dissipated process is turning the solar photon spectrum at 5,800 5, degrees Kelvin into the earth photon spectrum at 290 degrees Kelvin. So in just the same way that in the chemical reaction that if M is a good catalyst, the concentration of M will increase. The same way here that if M is a good catalyst for this dissipation of the photon spectrum, then we can show that M will increase in its environment much over and above the one would expect if it was not a catalyst for the dissipation of photons. Okay, and also then the global entropy production of the system will increase. Okay, and so this is for our next class. Next class, I want to get into how the information can be stored in DNA uh, through dissipation. And uh, this is, I'll just give you a very brief uh, review of what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, as I said, uh, the origin of life, we had temperatures about 85 degrees centigrade. So we had DNA floating on the ocean surface at this high temperature, but the temperature of Earth's surface was gradually decreasing. So at some point, it became below 85 degrees centigrade. And if you, if you biologists uh, remember the denaturing temperature of DNA of long strand DNA is about 85 degrees centigrade. Of course, it depends on the particular sequence of the bases and on how much salt you have in the environment, but it's around 85 degrees centigrade. So a temperature is above that, you would have only single strand. Let's say that these strands were all created through dissipative structuring under UVC light. And uh, uh, these temperatures above 85 degrees centigrade, you would have only single strand. But as the temperature of Earth's surface slowly dropped below 85 degrees centigrade, then they would form double strands. And they would not normally separate again because lower temperatures don't allow uh, DNA denaturing. However, in the daytime with the sun out on the surface of Earth, uh, the surface of the ocean, we are absorbing infrared light and also ultraviolet light in the DNA. And this is producing heat through dissipation and can cause the two strands to separate into two single strands. 
And then at night again, with little pieces of DNA, we can form two new strands where one single strand existed at the beginning of the day. So this is a, a process of reproduction like the PCR process, but here we are not increasing or decreasing the temperature. We are varying the light on the system. So we'll see more about that in the next class. In fact, this is one of the experiments that we did. And this is some of the work that Ivan did for his bachelor's thesis. So, well, thank you very much. And we still have time for questions. Anybody uh, have any questions? Podemos ya regresar a español. No olvides a abrir tu micrófono. No hay preguntas, entonces les voy a preguntar yo. ¿Cómo les fue en el libro de Pregosian? ¿Sí entendieron? ¿Sí leeron? Uh, ¿Leer? El primero. Apenas, apenas lo estoy empezando. Ok, Santos. Es mejor primero leer el libro y luego ver el video que tengo ahí en el YouTube, en el canal de YouTube. Está bien. Ok. Unas preguntas sobre esta que tocamos hoy. Mm. Creo que no, por ahora, pero okay. con respecto a, a la clase, eh, ¿estas se van a subir al Classroom o...? Sí, estoy ¿Sí? grabando ahorita, entonces voy a intentar a subirlo, como lo hizo con la, la vez pasado. Uh -huh. el, la clase primero también está en el, en el web, en el YouTube. Ah, ok, ok, gracias. Sí, para verlo más despacio, si quiere. Ok, gracias. Okay. ¿Otras preguntas? Todos si ya tienen el libro de producción en mi libro y conocen el sitio del... YouTube y Google, Google Classroom. Ahí cree que Iván... Si quieres... Yo todavía no tengo el Classroom, porque acá, esta es mi primera clase. Ah, tú eres Roberto, entonces. Sí. Ok, okay Roberto, te, te mando un email con el link, ¿no? Muchas gracias. Dame media hora después de la clase. Ok. Iván, ¿quieres decir algo sobre Google Classroom? ¿Cómo vas a manejar las los, este, sesiones de ayuda con los estudiantes? Este, sí, eh, nada más. Eh, pues yo creo que eh, en un ratito también les hago una publicación en Classroom. Eh, para ponernos de acuerdo para una primera reunión de, de asesoría. Eh, a la clase pasada habían dicho que ah, hubo alguien que quería revisar algunos conceptos de la termodinámica de equilibrio que no se acordaba o algo por el estilo. Podemos okay. hacer eso y si quieren ver algo más, pues lo vamos discutiendo en el Classroom. Nada más, eh, claro que... Es que aparezco como alumno en el Classroom, entonces no voy a poder Pero, comenzar las tareas. Sí, ya lo cambié. No sé por qué no te acepta. Lo voy a... ¿Sí checaste recientemente? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ok, entonces voy a, voy a regresar. Pero sí tienes los privilegios. Yo lo vi que tienes ahorita los privilegios de, de maestro. Pero déjame checar. Uh -huh. Y por qué okay. es nada más eso. Uh 
Ok, qué bien, excelente que estás ofreciendo esta ayuda ¿no? a los estudiantes. Imagino los biólogos porque creo que termodinámica no es parte de la currículo normal, ¿no? Para biólogos. Muy bien. Bueno, si no hay más preguntas, entonces terminamos para hoy. Y la próxima web seguimos con el segundo parte de la teoría disipativa del origen y evolución de la vida. Y si tienes preguntas que te ocurren luego, me puedes siempre mandarme un email. Es la mejor manera de comunicar conmigo. Bueno, muchas gracias entonces a todos y nos vemos en una semana. Gracias, gracias, hasta luego. Gracias. gracias. Buenas tardes. Hasta luego. Nos vemos.